A new report by the United Nations estimates that 16 African countries have lost an average of $97 billion per year due to terrorism since 2007. People in the affected countries are feeling the impact on the economy. All this is because of the Boko Haram. Before there were clients and money. Money was constantly changing hands. But now there is nothing because there are no people. There is no money, no job, no work. There is nothing at all. Hello, I'm Mubarak Henia and welcome to this week's edition of Africa Today. And I am Sheila Nelima. Welcome to this week's edition of Africa Today, which is focusing on the economic cost of terrorism in 18 African countries. We are asking, what is the ideology of these terrorists and how can they be eliminated? And in the second segment of our program, we shall discuss about the Africa Amnesty Month for the surrender and collection of illicit small arms and light weapons across the continent. We have also in store for you a variety of interesting news from all over Africa. And before we wind up, we'll peruse our social media pages for your comments. So stay tuned till the end of the show. Cost of terrorism in Africa. The United Nations Development Program recently launched a report on the economic costs of terrorism in Africa. The report titled Measuring the Economic Impact of Violent Extremism Leading to Terrorism in Africa estimates that 16 of the 18 focus countries have lost an average $97 billion per year in informal economic activity since 2007. According to the UNDP report, terrorism causes both direct costs in terms of deaths and injuries and indirect costs including lost productivity and earnings. It's very attractive. Very bright images, but they use guns as a kind of game. But you see, because we have an insurgency at hand, which we are battling, and we believe that we need to embark on de-radicalization of our you know, youth, I don't think I'm at liberty to tell you what class action that's for the security agencies to decide. Now to discuss the economic costs of terrorism in Africa, we have contacted Nefta Freeman, a coordinating committee member of the Black Alliance for Peace. Thanks a lot for your time, Mr. Freeman. Now, first question, what's your take on the UN report regarding the massive losses incurred by African countries due to terrorism in the continent? Turmoil that comes with extremism, it good, does a good job, I think, of detailing the, the issues with that, um, the impact, particularly disproportionate impact on women because of the, you know, the family members being prone to being recruitment or targeted um, will leave them having to struggle for families on their own. So it does a good job of those things. However, um, it does not deal with some historical context and the, the prevailing, like the began the conditions in Africa, like for, for example, the neocolonialism and the fact that Africa is still not independent and the nations are not really being able to provide and uh, for the people with the sustenance um, that, that is needed. And so it doesn't really talk about the root, um, what really root causes of the violent extremism and the losses also being tied to the international global economy. Thanks a lot, Mr. Nafta Freeman. The most prominent terrorist groups in Africa include Boko Haram of Nigeria, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, and Al-Shabaab of Somalia. The Wahhabi ideology, which is officially propagated by Saudi Arabia, is the main source of inspiration for these terrorist groups wrecking havoc in Africa. These terrorist groups are also affiliated to other global terror networks, such as Al-Qaeda and Daesh, which receive direct or indirect support from some countries such as Saudi Arabia. Now, Mr. Freeman, you stated that uh, the UN report failed to mention the root cause of terrorism in Africa. It is an open secret that these terrorist groups follow the Wahhabi ideology, which is officially practiced in Saudi Arabia, a major U.S. ally. Does this imply that the U.S. is complicit in spreading terror across Africa? From we know that the United States has often backed uh, extremist groups for their own ends and then only for the, those groups to not serve their interests anymore and for them to turn around and be posing as uh, against those groups um, and these groups in this region from Africa into the, to the Middle East. It's not surprising um, and, it, and it really speaks to a serious hypocrisy for the United States and the Western countries to 
be uh, positioning themselves as the, the combaters or the fighters of terrorism while at the same time creating the conditions that foster terrorism and supporting terrorism behind uh, violent extremism behind the backs of the, of the public, of the masses. Um, but it speaks to the fact that destabilization of the continent of Africa and de destabilization of these various regions serves the interest of the United States and, and other Western countries. Thanks for watching, Mr. Freeman, and stay tuned for more. Young people in Africa are targeted both by recruitment and radicalization to terrorist organizations. Since young men are more likely to be recruited or forcefully taken by terrorists, the burden on women becomes greater in terms of providing a livelihood and caring for their families. What are some of the factors that motivate young people to join terrorist groups in Africa? One, the root cause is that Africa has never really been able to, with the, with the intervention of colonialism, to develop on its own. And the same essential, uh, same essential relationship, economic relationship, exists under colonialism that exists now, where all of the massive resources and the, and the economies and the politics of countries are controlled by outside what we call neocolonialism. So countries aren't able to create the conditions that would uh, foster stable and confident and secure young people. And at the same time, there was another UN report that was done in 2017 that showed that, in, that interviewed a number of young people, and they said some of the things that prompted them to invite uh, and uh, join these groups. To prevent the recruitment of young people by terrorist groups in Africa, government and international development agencies are trying to put in place measures to empower the youth. Mohamed Yahya of the UNDP elaborates on the need to give young people opportunities. Let's take a listen. So to sustain peace in the Lake Chad region or all over Africa and to deny uh, uh, space for recruitment to terrorism in, in the continent, you really have to empower, give young people opportunities. You have to deal with issues that are displacing them and affecting their livelihoods, such as climate pressures. And you really have to ensure that uh, uh, th th that they're represented in the political processes. One of the most interesting facts is the medium age of an African is between 19 and 20. But an average age of an African leader is 66. The generational gap is also some of the things that we have to be dealt with, which means giving opportunity for young people in, uh, in leadership and, and, and giving them access at, at that level also is important. Some African governments have been blamed for exacerbating terrorism through their own counter-terrorism actions. Security analysts say tough and discriminatory treatment by security forces is one of the drivers of terrorism on the continent. The counter-terrorism strategies that have been adopted by many countries in Africa, um, most are about uh, deploying the military, simply just deploying military and using overwhelming force has actually failed. It has only succeeded in containing the terrorists, but it has not succeeded in preventing the recruitment of new fighters. Now, African governments are evidently not doing enough or unable to take effective measures to stop terrorism in the continent. What's the reason for this, Mr. Freeman? At the same time, the, uh, those, even if they wanted to, are sort of uh, held hostage to the dictates of the West, um, and they're not really able, they're not in a position to actually reorganize their societies, reorganize their economies to the benefit of the masses of the people that would take an anti-capitalist approach to redistributing land, redistributing things. The, the West would come down on them for that. Um, and so they make sure that's not happening. So they can't really do that. And these are things that are essential to, to combating the violent extremism because people would feel more confident and secure and, 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 be, and uh, belonging uh, in their own country. And so a lot of this is, the, the large, is largely the fault of the West, uh, making it incapable for those leaders and those, uh, the leading formations in the, on the continent of, to actually even do what, what really would be necessary. Mr. Freeman, you mentioned there the negative impact of interference by Western countries in Africa's war on terror. What can African governments do to succeed in restoring peace in their countries? The United States tends to take what they call it, you know, they, they require, they, they position 
the leadership to take what they call enemy combatants. They're classifying people as enemy combatants, and you can't uh, dub people enemy combatants and have a dialogue of peace or reconciliation if people are deemed enemy combatants. So they have to reject the, the uh, mandates of the West and the political dictates of the West and have to and start actually using the resources of their countries in, in a way that's much more equitable. Uh, to the masses of the people. That's the first. And then trying to establish some sort of uh, dialogue and trust, building trust back um, with, the, with the people that if they can, you know, make contact. Thanks for that, Mr. Freeman. We look forward to the elimination of these foreign-backed terrorists in Africa for the continent to enjoy peace and sustainable development. And now we move to the next part of our show where we bring you news updates from across Africa. What do you have for us today, Sheila? Thank you, Henia. This week, Nigeria is dominating our newscast, but for all the right reasons. First off, President Buhari of Nigeria applauded the Girl Education Project by stating that the West African country was experiencing an increase in girls' enrollment and retention in schools. The Nigerian government further announced that it is vigorously implementing the Universal Basic Education Program and Safe School Initiatives. The statements were made in the Fourth World Conference on women. Now still on Nigeria, the Minister of Transportation, Mr. Rotimi, disclosed that the Lagos Ibadan railway project will be completed by January 2021. The project is estimated to cost around $1.6 billion. It seeks to save the roads from being destroyed by trucks that are plying excess cargo. Now, Rwandan genocide suspect Felician Kabuga will be tried in Tanzania. Kabuga, who was arrested in May, will be extradited to a UN court in Tanzania. He will be tried on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. The decision was welcomed and celebrated by all as incredibly good news. Now Learn at Home, a COVID-19 recovery and resilience program is helping 1 million students in Nigeria keep up with learning. The program enables remote learning no matter location or access to internet. The initiative is being headed by Data Science Nigeria, Malaysia, and the Mastercard Foundation. Now on to other good news. Togo has appointed its first woman prime minister, Victoire Tomega Dobe, previously served as the president's chief of staff since 2009, and she has held several ministerial positions, including grassroots development and youth employment. She will be the head of the government of Togo. Now, the Global Capital Bond Awards 2020 selected the African Development Bank as the best issuer of COVID-19 bond for its $3 billion fight COVID-19 social bond. The ceremony was held virtually for the first time in 12 years. The bank took the lead in a poll of well-acclaimed market players. Now that's all for now. Visit our social media pages for more news updates and our episode highlights. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Surrender of illegal guns in Africa. September was the African Union designated month when civilians in possession of illegally owned weapons were urged to hand them in to authorities without facing arrest or prosecution. The 29th summit of the African Union held in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia from 3rd to 4th of July 2017 declared the month of September of each year until 2020 as Africa Amnesty Month for the surrender and collection of illicit small arms and light weapons. Mr. Ramtane Lamara, the African Union High Representative for Silencing the Guns, elaborates here on the importance of surrendering illegal guns in Africa. The African leaders have come to realize that very little of their ambitious project for Africa could be actually accomplished if they don't succeed in silencing the guns. 
Now, for more on this subject, we contacted Gugu Dube, researcher and complex threats in Africa program at the Institute of Security Studies. Now, thank you, Ms. Dube, for joining us today. What is the likelihood of success in this campaign of silencing the guns in Africa? Thank you. I believe that amnesty must be accompanied by practical steps and tools because amnesty alone is not sustainable in silencing the guns in Africa. We need to improve on a number of areas, for example, marking and tracing of firearms and stockpile management of firearm, firearms, amongst others. And then this would then lead up to the success of this campaign in the years to come. There's a lot of positive energy and there's a lot of commitment coming through and we do believe that in time this would be possible. Thank you, Ms. Gugu Dube. Stay tuned for more. Millions of light arms were shipped to Africa during the Cold War. Recent seizures of newer models show that the arms trade is fueled by weapons diverted from national stockpiles and peacekeeping forces, as well as arms imported from other regions. A UN report revealed that the Israeli regime weapons have been used widely in the deadly South Sudan civil war. U.S. weapons have also been used in wildlife poaching across Africa. Smile Shergi, the African Union Commissioner for Peace and Security, believes that the campaign to surrender illegal arms is also a message to foreign suppliers that enough is enough. Silencing the guns, it's not only the responsibility of Africa Union Commission, it is also the responsibility of each and every country in our continent. It is also a, a strong signal outside the continent. Those who are still pouring more armaments in this, in this continent and trying to militarize it. We hopefully get the understanding of everybody that enough is enough when uh, it comes to uh, bringing more armaments in the continent. South Africa, whose president is the current chairperson of the African Union, organized a major campaign of the removal of illegal and unwanted firearms through a firearm amnesty. Speaking in January this year, after witnessing the surrender of illegally possessed firearms, the South African police minister termed such firearms as the enemy of the society. Firearms remain the enemy of our society and we as SEPs must do all in our power to protect communities from these legal, illegal acquired weapons. The declaration of this amnesty period is in the interest of the public and I believe it will make a dent in dealing decisively with the access of illegal firearms and wanted firearms that end up in the wrong hands. How have the illegally owned weapons impacted negatively on the development of Africa? There certainly has been a negative impact. For example, one impact it just goes to show that 39 out of 242 unplanned explosions at munition sites in Africa have occurred in the last 10 years. And this, and this occurs mainly due to old or poorly managed armories. We need public policies and awareness campaigns on the dangers and the prevention of unplanned explosions at munition sites and should be mainstreamed within the silencing the guns frameworks in Africa. Thanks for that, Ms. Dube. Stay tuned for more. Vladimir Voronkov, executive director of the UN Counterterrorism Center, says the African continent alone has 100 million uncontrolled small arms and light weapons. Speaking in February, he said countries face challenges in detecting the smuggling of small weapons. Insufficient international response in countering the illicit trafficking of small arms and light weapons the challenges that some member states face to detect and seize them, as well as porous borders, allow terrorists and criminals to move illicit weapons from one country or region to another. What can African countries practically do to stop cross-border trade, especially considering the porous borders of most of them? The first step is that African states amongst each other need to communicate more and there have been great strides, particularly within the SADC region. 
for example, with the revision of the SADC protocol on firearms, it shows a huge commitment in terms of trying to curb the illicit trade of firearms, that there is an awareness that the times have changed for for example, with the set of protocol that was from 2001 up until now in 2020, that we need to address certain challenges because um, there have been progressions even in terms of the types of criminality that occur within our porous borders as well. Communal conflicts between herders and farmers over water and pasture Violent urban crime and cultural practices such as cattle rustling are also of concern. This is because firearms have become the weapons of choice, replacing traditional and less deadly weapons. What needs to be done to reverse the culture of violence that has contributed to the spread of illicit weapons in Africa? I believe that we need not only to have great policies and protocols in place, but we all need to find ways that don't just leave it up to the governments alone. The media has a role, civil society has a role, individuals within society have a role to play because we need to have a mind shift from reacting to to the effects of violence only, but instead we should be preventing the violence. Thanks for staying with us. In this segment, we are going to look at your different views from across all our social media pages. Now, in the topic discussing the oil spill in Mauritius by MV Wakashio, we had Murando Dimitri stating that the coral reefs are under a great threat, keeping in mind what they do to the ocean ecosystem. We also had F. Mimat stating, it is unfair and unnecessary that people are blaming the Japanese people for this ecological disaster. There should be an independent and international inquiry. All parties responsible should be prosecuted. We also had Monkley stating, huge compliment to the Mauritian people and the whole community. They handle the oil spill case without any resources or help, despite the authorities' bad crisis management. Now on the topic of UK's blood tea in Kenya, we had Mvita One stating, half of the tea drunk in the UK comes from Kenya. Boris Johnson, apparently from stolen land. We also had Gitao Moses stating, if the world could know what our farmers went through and still go through, they wouldn't buy this blood tea. We also had MGG stating, I'm just concerned why they call it UK tea. They stole land, grow tea, and we are out here celebrating drinking UK tea that is basically all ours. Now thanks for all your comments. Kindly don't forget to share with us on what you would like to see in the program. We do value your feedback. Till next time. And that wraps it up for this edition of Africa Today, which focused on the economic cost of terrorism in Africa. These are terrorists who are inspired by the Saudi ideology of Wahhabism. We also discussed the campaign to collect illegal arms in Africa. We honestly hope that Africa will be free of terrorism and illicit arms and that peace and prosperity will prevail across the continent. We do welcome your comments on the topics uh, which are covered here at Africa Today. On behalf of the entire Africa Today team, thanks for watching our show today and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>